right, you ready? Yes. <laughs> I don't know, I'm in a weird mood today, so this is going to be strange. Okay. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Hi guys, welcome back and we're having another interview. I know you guys are enjoying them so we're going to keep on doing them for the lockdown and I have one of my favourite people in the whole wide world with me here today. It's Miss Molly Roberts. Yay! Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. You're so welcome. And I thought <laughs> we would talk about creativity today and we're going to try and uh, we're going to try and get beyond the very standard idea of what creativity is because you know, we can, we can talk about, you know, creativity 101, what we do, but I feel like we want to get, we want to get beyond that. We want to get deeper than that. We want to get to the juicy stuff. I don't know what all the hand motions are about. Enjoy them. It's fine. I'm in a weird mood, so it's going to be <laughs> all hand motions all the time. So, the juicy stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question let's let's make it a really difficult question right off the bat for molly what what do you think the essence of creativity is for you problem solving ah. yeah i think that's what the essence of creativity is for me i think that creativity doesn't necessarily mean that you are making something artistically you know it could be it might be through painting but i think the essence of creativity is maybe two part i would say problem solving mm -hmm. um, and sometimes they're fun problems to solve or problems to solve for our own entertainment that's possible too uh -huh. uh, but also creativity the essence of creativity is taking action on intuitive hits mm. i think those you can be, I get a lot of people who write to me about, I'm not creative, or I used to be creative. That like, that hurts my heart. I used to be creative. And it's like, no, you're still creative. It's part of your experience as a human being on this planet. That is your gift. Everyone has it and they express it in different ways, but you don't, you don't lose it. I mean, you can do things to enhance it, but nobody, nobody or nothing really takes it away from you as yeah as long as you continue to use it to solve problems yeah. I like what about that. you i like that a lot um well i was thinking for me it, it often comes around as kind of expression so mm -hmm. creativity for me is kind of that's why we're all different in how we're creative because we all have a different perspective of the world and we all interact with the world slightly differently and so we all express our experiences our dreams our hopes and fears in a slightly different way we express who we are and whether we take that you know pen and paper whether we're painting on a canvas whether we're speaking that into being is all very much highly individualized depending on who we are so creativity for me is kind of like it's just soul speak in a different way of looking at it so it's your you're this, this bright fuzzy little soul floating around in the universe and you're like right i gotta express myself like this and that is that actually makes me feel sad about the people who's you know are like i'm not creative or, or um i used to be because it's almost like they've lost touch with their inner voice a little bit and, and they don't know how to express themselves anymore. Or maybe they've been through changes along the journey and then they found themselves silent for whatever reason. Um, and although that can be a moment of contemplation, uh, it can also feel like, like wounding. Like if you, if you feel too wounded to express yourself, then that might be something that's going on in that area. And maybe it's more to do with just allowing yourself the time and the healing so you can start to express who you you feel yourself to be at that moment and it doesn't have to be pretty either that's the other thing um it can be like i was talking to the patrons yesterday about finding like the beauty in the grotesque because it's bave it's bave month basically right so that's what we're we we started the month with bave being like right stitching body pieces back together in this big symbolic soul song that came through and i was like oh we're starting off light then <laughs> we're like we're frankensteining right okay um and so it was that kind of idea i had already come into my conscious mind of that kind of the 
the beauty and the grotesque and that maybe applies to what we're all going through right now which is finding beauty in places where we feel uncomfortable and we don't know what to expect which is what's happening in the world right now i would agree with that assessment yeah and to, to add on to your point previously about yeah losing sort of feeling like people have lost this ability to speak or to express themselves that when I work with people in terms of, of reviving their creativity that it's it's not really talking about it in a way that it's been taken or destroyed but really just a communication breakdown and that's something you can do something about very easily so. mm. That's interesting because it's I didn't really expect it to immediately, but it's already bridging that gap between kind of shadow work and creativity. That kind of, like, of creativity is shadow work. We just call it something else because outside of our outside of our community, shadow work is doesn't mean any. You know, people don't understand what that means. It doesn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. um, and I know people write to me frequently, like, well, how do I do art magic with shadow work? And it's like. You, you don't have to, you know, it already is. Mm. It, it, it already is. A lot of the themes that come out in your work, themes that come out in your life, <laughs> yeah. they meet. So you don't, it doesn't, you can make it a specific artistic expression that's about shadow work or addressing a shadow or addressing a trauma or things like that. But most of the time, it'll turn out that way anyway. Mm. So it works for us on a lot of levels, I think. So that's kind of the advice then for people who are looking at it to try and heal the shadow or are working through. So if, if you're looking at as confused for shadow work, shadow work is, is just in case. <laughs> I know most people in the community will know what we mean, but just in case, uh, it's basically where you are working through the difficult parts of self is I think the easiest way of putting it. Memories, experiences, um, emotions and that can be the whole range of emotions because i think people sort of lump shadow work into like this negative thing and for me it's like there are no negative emotions and you can feel the whole you can feel all of the emotions when you're working through a particular memory a particular cycle of your existence where you, you struggle with maybe i'm trying to think of an easy example so maybe you have coping mechanisms because at one point during your life you went through something that was traumatic and and you're trying to unravel those coping mechanisms now because whilst they got you through that stage then then unhealthy now when you're trying to go from surviving into like thriving um and so maybe art or poetry or the spoken word comes into that in a, in a kind of shadow work by release and owning it sometimes owning the thing is really really empowering so does that cover it <laughs> yeah and i think well that, that 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 made me think of, of two things that i'd like to add to that because i think that's very true uh, one that yeah it's okay to if you're yeah to creatively express it doesn't necessarily have to be a consumable for somebody else uh -huh. to be productive it is also okay that if you know you're doing shadow work in a creative sphere that you don't get everything out or work everything out in one piece or one song or one book or whatever it is. It's probably going to be a series. It's probably going to be a lifelong investigation. So I think that's um, a place that that I find I find personally that I get stuck with shadow work too is finding like am I done yet? <laughs> We're never done. No. It's never right. <laughs> no. That journey yeah, of self-improvement. That you, you know, that being creative doesn't always mean, yeah, producing something for, mm. and when I say consume, I mean to show to an audience, mm. you know, whether that's sharing it publicly on Instagram or, you know, anything like that. You can if that's cathartic for you, but it's not a meaningless exercise if you choose to keep that gem to yourself that's okay too it's still very very powerful very powerful there's something really interesting in that thought as well because there is almost an expectation that if you are creating you're creating to be of service for, to someone else outside of the self 
Mm -hmm. and you can you can create to honor yourself you can create to honor your gods or goddesses or spirits you can create to honor your ancestors you can you can create for so many different reasons that don't have to be about someone else how do you think we got to the point where it all became very much about expression for someone else's benefit Mm, I think that's really a, a huge topic, mm -hmm. but I don't want to, the, the first place my mind goes to is development of social media and how we communicate. Mm -hmm. um, we used to have what I think now <laughs> is sort of the gift of a certain level of privacy a gift of not a not performative life mm. not having to prove to other people that we exist in a series of disjointed images that are taken out of time and out of context it does a lot of really freaking magical things i will not take that away from it but like all things um you know, as we learned in The Last Unicorn. <laughs> Magic requires a liver, okay? It's going to do some really cool stuff, but somebody's losing a liver, okay? So, <laughs> I, like, I'm just going to just, like, hold my liver over here and just move it on the screen. <laughs> I don't want it. I don't want to. I'm just saying. <laughs> like, um, thumbs up if you get The Last Unicorn. But anyway, tangential. Um, this yeah that that a certain amount of likes or a certain amount of response that if something is good or was good for us that the peanut gallery must come to consensus on how they feel about that mm -hmm. and it can be really uplifting in a lot of ways and i think equally as destructive and it's a real part of our life now so i, I don't think we can deny that that has a lot to do with it but at the same time I mean people have always wanted affirmation mm. that they're doing the right thing that they're on the right path that they made something beautiful that that their existence matters to people and the internet lets us do that for more people than ever mm. so I think it's interesting what do you think I think it's a large part of it but I think maybe we've always been trained uh maybe even a little bit more as women um that other people's opinion of us matters and men get it too and and it has changed over the years but uh the preoccupation with beauty with when regards to to women um is one of those things which is again it's a huge massive topic but it's it's kind of given that you want to be beautiful you want to present this idea of beauty to the world and often when we, people are creating i think it almost becomes an extension of that like i want someone to understand how how much effort i have put into creating this thing and appreciate that um and i think art does allow art in and in, in all forms but we'll, we'll use painting because i think that's the most easy from an aesthetic perspective for this part of the conversation but you can present something which is macabre you can present something which is grotesque you can present something which is not stereotypically pretty and then ask people to consider it and though there is that idea of art is something to be considered um, by other people they don't have to appreciate it they don't have to like it but that kind of consideration is is a part of it um, of, of how art is is consumed and I think maybe we're so sort of tapped into this idea of um, approval from other people um, and it's endless as well because you can't please everyone so it's like this unachievable goal that a lot of us uh, are almost conditioned into like oh if if i if i'm just found to be beautiful then everything will be better 
Uh, and I struggle with it with weight loss, for example, because I'm in the process of losing weight and I want to do that for myself. I want to feel good in my skin um, and I want to shed a lot of the weight that I gained as a part of trauma. So for me, there is different layers of of why I want to do it. But at the same time, I can't sit here and be like, I'll be happier if I'm just thinner and I feel more beautiful because one thing doesn't equal the other. And um, it's a trap, basically. <laughs> And it doesn't guarantee anything because again happiness is more in the memories that you make the expression of self the expression and connection you have with other people and that's what true creativity is is getting back to that expression of self um and you know creativity can play into things like i love playing with makeup for example and i get such hate sometimes that people are like you're shallow and i'm like you have no clue clearly the, the, the power you can do playing with makeup, with using colour, putting certain colours on your face because, you know, you want to imbue yourself with that colour magic. And if I was putting war paint on my face, I'd probably get less of a reaction than just standard makeup. And there's some weird disconnect there um, as to why that is. Like one is considered more magical and more spiritual and more legit and the other is somehow shallow and yet expected at the same time. <laughs> so there's that 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 weird there is weird social conditionings that a lot of them feel like they're at odds with each other as well like you can never win i think that there's a lot to that i also think that to sort of circle back to you know when you're having a really large conversation with lots of people in the room which is what you know uh, the online world is the village is gigantic and you, you cannot you cannot please all of the guests at the party ever because most of the guests at the party don't even know what they want so yeah it's a difficult it, it can be it can turn into an all-consuming um, you know, career of sorts if you if, <laughs> if you really want but I think it's also important to you know go where you're loved mm. that's where you belong yeah yeah and there is i think there's a real important in just expressing yourself regardless as well if you have something that you need to express uh, and if you are creating something with it then do that because i think the fear of not being accepted the fear of retaliation from the social media world or the world at large for expression is real and it's interesting that we still there are still people who make movies or pieces of art or whatever and they're called courageous because they are coming at it from a different perspective or they're shining light on a problem that you know isn't usually talked about and they're called courageous for doing that and sometimes that seems such a strange thing that just to express the truth because it's not the standard truth is somehow courageous and it kind of is because you know the mob mentality that can happen with cancel culture and backlash and all the rest of it sometimes for good reason and sometimes not at all um, puts people out of business it, it you know puts people on scare lists and gets people doxxed and all sorts of terrifying things so I get the fear is real but it's strange that we, we've almost dis, discouraged creativity in some ways I think in a lot of ways creativity is still seen as being subversive on some level and sometimes it is uh, <laughs> and that's a good thing um but uh, yeah i mean anytime anytime you are you don't even have to be creating something brand new you might just have to be the first person perhaps in your family or in your social circle or where you work or you know your immediate surroundings to decide you're going to explore something or take something further than your group has decided is acceptable that that fear is real but it's also not real it is and it's not you know um 
I think a lot of that comes from sort of our, our instinct, you know, we need other people to live, we need, you know, for, for somebody to, you know, take care of us when we're puppies, you know, the brain says this is what you need to do. And so I think that somewhere deep down in the lizard brain, we're afraid to diverge because we're afraid that on some level that's, that's death for us, that's excommunication, but that's really not the truth. If you, if you do follow and you happen to break out of, you know, the orbit of the current group of thought, wherever you find yourself, you'll be, you'll be on a trajectory to find a new orbit with other people. So you will survive. <laughs> and it can be the making of you sometimes. Um, it, it doesn't feel like that in that catalyst moment, but no, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't feel like it. But sometimes when you, when you do that, when you break out of the mold and then you, you look back a year or two later, you'll realize it was, one of those giant leaps of faith moments which leads you to a better sense of self and a healthier environment and things like that so uh, we'll just nod knowingly <laughs> do the do the thing <laughs> <laughs> that's right down the middle that's where i'm cutting it that was right at that 30 minutes i'm gonna end it on me going do the thing <laughs> So what do you think is um, some of the most difficult examples of creativity in your life that you're happy to share with us? And how did you go about overcoming them? Difficult moments. Are, are, um, I want to make sure that I understand the question. Mm -hmm. uh, like moments of, of creative growth, do you think? or mm -hmm. Yeah, let's okay. go with that. Okay. Uh, Probably the first example that comes to mind is the very first record I made with my band was a big learning experience. And it was difficult for me as, I want to say as an artist, but it was also difficult for me just as a person because I lacked confidence in myself and I needed affirmation from the people around me so badly that I really allowed it to crush me and ultimately rob me of the joy of the experience. Like, this should be a wonderful thing, right? And I think that you remember forever. And I feel differently about it now. Like you were saying at the time, those things never feel good. But later on, there are key points in the story. And it was a process of learning how to tell the difference between constructive criticism and just abuse, <laughs> mm -hmm. I guess is, is the way I would say that, you know, people who say that they're going to be brutally honest with you are usually more interested in the first part. Than mm -hmm. the that reminds uh, me of that little meme that's been going around, which is like, I'm not interested in your brutal honesty. Where is your compassionate honesty? Where is your supportive honesty? Things of that nature. Because I agree. Every time anybody has ever said, I'm just brutally honest, it's like, no, you're not. You're looking for an excuse to be an asshole. And that's your like go-to line to, to be nasty to someone for whatever reason. Um, so yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes, sometimes that creative lesson, um, which I've, I've learned many times, in my younger years is sort of, yeah, how to discern the difference between a mentor and an asshole. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. The same. Uh, and that's, that's not necessarily the case, but that's, that's an example of growth. You, you gain sovereignty. The more experiments you do, the more sovereignty you gain. The better your discernment gets, the sharper it gets, and the clearer you are. Hmm. So, I think, I think that was a big time example, um, working with a producer for, for the first time. Anybody who's done that knows that that can be raw, that can feel raw. Mm. <laughs> um, when I was in art school too, preparing for my, my senior thesis, so the, the show that I was preparing to graduate, I had a professor who was, again, very interested in brutal honesty. And I had created a series of work. I'd actually dedicated all of my years of art school to the same subject matter. I was interested in exploring the divine feminine 
in painting and I was a figure painter and that was where my passion was and my joy was and we're reviewing my work the night before the show is supposed to open and he tells me that my work is absolutely pointless this represents nothing this has all been done before and is decorative at best <sighs> and I decided you know what I don't think there's anything wrong with decorative if that's going to be my purpose in this life is to beautify things, if, you know, if it's beautifying blank canvases or beautifying myself or beautifying the spaces I live or when I was doing curating lots of art shows, if it was about creating beauty experiences for other people, sounds pretty damn good to me. That oh, feels like a worthwhile life pursuit. And for me, that was a lot about, you no, know, maybe that's what, that's what learning about the divine feminine became about for me. It wasn't like, how do I, how do I present pictures of her to people? It was how do I create those experiences for people? Because beauty is not worthless. Beauty is not a, a throwaway thing. Beauty is restorative. And that horrible experience really put me on the trajectory for my life to this date talking to you about it right now so <laughs> it's funny those are the two big ones that come to mind yeah it's funny because today I'd been working with Aphrodite and I was mm -hmm. creating a smudge just for somebody's order and uh I was looking at the uh the well, let's call it the recipe um and I was like I'd done this a while back and I was like this this doesn't feel like it's deep enough for me. I want to, I want to add some layers to it. I want to, you know, evolve it now that I've evolved along my path and I'm going to evolve this recipe. And so once I did it, I sat, this is one of the ways that I create beauty is through scent. And mm. I absolutely freaking adore the process of like layering different scents together and it, it weaves an energetic matrix. It's just Oh, it's one of my favorite things to do and so I was doing this for Aphrodite and I was like I did this and I, I, I get very witchy about it I like, did this and I did that and cackle and bit of this and I did that and cackle some more <laughs> and ended up with a really beautiful scent that I was really pleased with and I was like right now we're gonna have to do incense sticks and the aura spray and the anointing oil because we have to now because look at this smell it needs to be a whole thing um, and <clears throat> For me, Aphrodite was a really difficult goddess to connect with. And I think, mm -hmm. like I said in my uh, Instagram post, some of this I'm blaming on the, the show, the Hercules show that was out in the 90s, um, the, the one that was with Xena, because their portrayal of Aphrodite was awful. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very like, um, like college girl, like mean girl stereotype of Aphrodite and that feeds to me into this idea of because she was in charge of beauty and love and then she had been made into um, an airhead basically and the patriarchal Greek myth made her into like you know spiteful and jealous and, and catty mm -hmm. and, yeah mm -hmm. and it it took me a really long time to just overthrow that that story I've been fed particularly with Aphrodite like none of the other goddesses I had such trouble with like I'd always had a feeling that Hera wasn't um who she was made out to be um but the Aphrodite getting over that for me was a hurdle was a lesson um because it was so deeply entrenched this idea of like beauty and selfishness and beauty and like jealousy and like nothing no depth that's what it is that there was no depth behind it and I had a moment of like, I had a moment of shame for allowing myself to like feed into that, that, that idea that, you know, she's this beautiful love goddess. So of course she's, you know, shallow or jealous or, you know, mean. Um, and I had to really pull through the layers of my own conditioning to get beyond the idea that beauty and love and, and, and the divine feminine that is Aphrodite I can feel her energy now like shunting down my arms and down my head um was just without depth and I think that feeds into what you're saying like the idea that just decorative has no depth is really bizarre 
really odd um, because for me, a lot of what I do, Taurus Moon, is make things look beautiful. Um, and they have depth because they're spiritual tools. They're, they're meant to feed people's magic. They're meant to support people. They're meant to protect people. They're meant to do whatever it is the particular item is made to do. But at the same time, my Taurus moon is like, this must have this amount of shimmy and this amount of color and all the pretty things. And we're, then we're going to take pictures and we're going to tell a story with the photographs. Like I've had people be like, how do you, how do you do this photography? And I'm like, I can't teach you to do this <laughs> because I don't know how I do it. I just sit there. It's magic. Basically. I just sit there and I arrange and that, 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 that and snap, um, and then play with lighting. Um, but the idea that there is no depth behind decoration is so weird because you have jewelry magic, amulet magic, color magic in, in like I already mentioned in makeup and, and wall paint and all the rest of it, scent, like scent is generally a perfume or whatever and is thought to be, you know, like an extra. Um, it's interesting. 